Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Royce, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are all going to set sail and explore the folklore of the sea. Yes, the folklore of the Welsh waters. And we are going to look at a tale involving the devil sailing around the Welsh coast in order to harvest souls to take back down to hell. We are going to look at a strange variety of corpse candle, a nautical corpse candle, I guess you could call it, that would illuminate, eerily illuminate the high seas. And we are going to look at the magical properties of what Richard Burton described as Welsh man's caviar. Yes, Welsh man's caviar and a heck of a lot more coming up. So I hope you don't suffer from seasickness or anything because this is going to be a particularly salty episode. Now, anyone lucky enough to live in Wales or to have visited Wales or even to have just had a look at the shape of Wales on Google Maps or something will know that the country is surrounded by water. The sea plays a huge part in daily life for a lot of people. And with the exception of the border with England, the rest of the country is surrounded by this this salty water containing whatever devils and corpse candles and other strange beasts and creatures are lurking out there in the waves. And did you know, here's my quick fact for the episode, but did you know the whale's coast path was the first of its kind in the world. It's the first path that allows you to walk around an entire country's coastline. And if you attempted it, it might take you an hour or two because it is 870 miles long, so I'm told. 870 miles. So if this episode does inspire you in some way to go and explore this folklore, this seafaring folklore for yourself, you might be in for a little bit of a walk if you attempt the entire coast path. But anyway, I'm I'm starting to sound like a Visit Wales advert, so never mind that. Back to the folklore. And to help me with this episode, I have turned to one of my favourite Edwardian folklorists, and that is Mary Trevelyan, who recorded a lot of Welsh folklore, Welsh folktales, back in the early 1900s. And one of the great things about Trevelyan's work, what I really like about it, is that she doesn't mince her words. She doesn't get all flowery and waffle on like like I do. She gets straight to the point and you get lots and lots of folklore in a small space from her. And as a result, this podcast is going to cram in a heck of a lot of folklore in quite a rapid fire fashion. It almost comes across like bullet points even. So hold on tight because I am going to overload you with so much fantastic folklore. It's going to feel like this ship is sailing at a thousand miles an hour. And she begins by telling us that in Wales, the sea, as well as the lakes and the rivers and the fountains and the springs, the wells, the cascades, the torrents and the pools, anything watery by the sounds of it, but it's the sea that we are focusing on. But all of these watery places have much folklore and many folk stories attached to them. As I'm sure regular listeners to this podcast will have picked up on, there are plenty of ladies in lakes and Tulloth Teg in rivers and God knows what in fountains. But when it comes to the sea, there are two important numbers to bear in mind. They are the number seven and the number nine. And they relate directly to the first piece of life-saving advice that Trevelyan gives us. And that is the seventh and the ninth waves of the sea were regarded as rescuing waters and of greater force than any that proceeded. And there was an old saying in Wales that if a drowning man can catch the seventh or ninth wave, he will be saved. But on the other hand, if a man swimming to shore is overtaken 
by one of those waves, the chances are against his ever reaching land. So yes, while they can save your life, they can also spell doom as well. The seventh wave and the ninth wave in particular, you need to catch on to because once they go, you are effectively left to the sea's mercy. And while the seventh or the number seven is quite popular in not just in Welsh folklore, in folklore in general, this idea of the, the seventh son with some miraculous abilities or the seventh daughter as well, it is the number nine or the ninth which continues to be important here when it comes to the sea. And we are told that if somebody fell ill, if somebody needed something, some kind of course to heal them, it was customary to bathe nine mornings in succession in the sea. If you are unwell, the doctors can't help, you can try bathing for nine mornings in succession in the sea. And if it's anything like the sea by me, I would put some thermal speedos on or whatever it is that you wear to go swimming because it is icy cold the vast majority of the time. But, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're tough enough to handle that, if you can handle going in the sea for nine days in a row in the icy cold sea by me, then you can take it a step further because nine plunges in the sea in one morning, in succession if possible, we are told, were good for nervous people. Maybe you'd like to cure both. Maybe you are nervous and you also have some other ailment, in which case you need to jump in the sea nine times in a row for nine days in a row. And finally, when it comes to good health, and unfortunately I'm a little bit late for this one myself, as are most of the people listening to this, I imagine, but it was said that if anyone began in childhood by taking a dose of seawater immediately upon getting out of bed every day, they would live to attain a great age. So if anyone does have any children or a child and you would like them to live forever or to a great age at least anyway, be sure to leave a glass of seawater next to the bed for them each day, ready for when they wake up. It'll do them wonders. Well, at least that's what Welsh folklore tells us anyway. And there's more. I did warn you that Trevelyan is quite rapid fire with these points, but there's more. And she tells us that people born near the sea were supposed to be brave. So if you do have a child and you want them to live for a long time and they happen to have been born by the sea, they could have a very long and a very brave life. And she also gives us some little pointers on how to use seaweed, which as you may or may not know, is something of a delicacy in certain parts of Wales. People eat lava bread. Yes, lava bread, a traditional Welsh food, a form of, uh, it's, it's a form of dried edible seaweed that people would have traditionally eaten with a full cooked breakfast say a full cooked welsh breakfast which if you can imagine a full cooked english breakfast say but you swap the black pudding for something from the sea for lava bread or cockles or something maybe and if you are sitting there pulling a face thinking how the heck can anyone eat seaweed what is wrong with these people well Richard Burton, the world's greatest actor, described lava bread as Welshman's caviar. And I think if it's good enough for Richard Burton, if it's Richard Burton's caviar, then I think it's good enough for us mere mortals to eat as well. But more than that, it's not just lava bread. It's not just food. It could also save your life from evil spirits. And how many food things can claim that? Not just a tasty part of your full Welsh breakfast, it can also protect you from evil spirits. And we are told that a bunch of seaweed kept hanging in the back kitchen scared away evil spirits. 
and also on many parts of the shoreline of Wales, the sea mistletoe can be used as a barometer. So sea mistletoe could be used to tell the weather. And this was particularly important for people living on the coast, certainly in times gone by, because while we we can laugh and joke about some of the, the silly traditions and the silly folklore surrounding it, for a lot of people living and working on the coast, could be a matter of life and death. And it really did help if you knew beforehand whether or not you should set sail on that day. And one way of predicting the weather in a way was to place that sea mistletoe in a bottle of seawater to seal it down. And when that water becomes dark or muddy, a storm or heavy rain may be expected. But so long as the water remains clear and untroubled, the weather will be fair. Now, how effective that was, I have no idea. I've, I've never tried it. But as mentioned, for those going out, sailing the seas and catching the fish, anything which, which could help in any way, I imagine, was taken slightly more seriously than we take it nowadays. And... Talking about catching fish, and this is quite quite strange, and I think this is quite quite unique to Wales. But you know, I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong. But in Wales, despite having all this coastline, all this water, all these fishermen out there, we are told that very little fish was actually eaten in Wales. It seems a bit silly because. Certainly, if times are hard and you've got the, the bounty of the sea out there just waiting to, to, to go out and be, to be farmed, as it were, why you wouldn't eat as much of it as possible. But folklore tells us that there are two reasons why very little fish was eaten from the seas of Wales. And not just the seas, all of those, those wonderfully watery folkloric places I mentioned, the rivers, the fountains, the springs, anywhere a fish could be plucked from, as it were, could be caught from, we are told that because they were considered to be objects of devotion, it was not considered the the done thing to be eating fish from these revered places. And the second reason for not eating too much fish is a little bit more morbid, shall we say. And it was said that it was commonly believed in, in inverted commas, fishes lived on the bodies of the drowned. Yes, it was believed that fishes lived on the bodies of the drowned. And sadly, or maybe it's for the best, Trevelyan doesn't really expand on that point. It's, it's probably quite self-explanatory, isn't it? I mean, if, if the fishes have... Actually, actually let, let's, let's not dwell on that point. Let's move on to some happier folklore. Happier folklore, which concerns white waves. Those big, crashing, gigantic waves, which look so good on weather reports. And if we're talking about white waves in Wales in particular, whenever there is bad stormy weather in the UK, there are certain places people always go to to get the best photographs of these waves in action. I'm thinking of places like Porth Coal, which crops up a lot, Aberystwyth, and if you are listening to this from some far-flung part of the world, just do an internet search for whales and waves, and you will see plenty of pictures of Porth Coal and Aberystwyth and all the other places that make such dramatic backdrops to these white waves. But what the people taking those photos do not realise is the fantastical folklore that goes along with those waves. Which, we are told, in days gone by, people would watch them with awe. They would be awestruck watching these waves. Well, they still are nowadays, but particularly back then, because people believed that the crashing waves were, in fact, the spirits of the departed, who had met their death by drowning. So, when I said happier folklore. Maybe I was a little bit hasty just then. We haven't quite reached the happier folklore yet, but these crashing white waves were believed to be the spirits of the departed who had died in the water. And if you wanted to see them, there were particular times, and the old people believed that at Christmas, at Easter, and All Hallows' Eve, Norse Kalangayev, all of those who had been drowned in the sea, came up 
to ride over the waves on white horses and held remarkable revels. So those waves are not just the spirits of the departed. They are the spirits of the departed riding on white horses and having one heck of a party to celebrate Christmas, Easter or Halloween. And there are some white waves in particular around, we are told, the dangerous sands of Nash. Nash Point in what was South Glamorgan in Trevelyan's time, which isn't a million miles away from... Porth Cole, as mentioned earlier, that wonderful spot for catching these waves hitting the rocks. But it was in Nash, around Nash Point, that these waves had a particular name. These waves were known as the Merry Dancers. The spirits of the departed were known as the Merry Dancers. So maybe there is a happy part to this little piece of folklore after all. They were certainly, by the sounds of it, enjoying themselves as they rode on the waves. Now, moving on to the sailors themselves, the Welsh sailors. And we are told that the, the famous expression, Davy Jones's locker, is supposed to have originated in Wales. And Davy Jones's locker is an expression which means the bottom of the sea, or to put it more bluntly, it means where dead sailors go when they sink to the bottom of the sea. And I think the expression would be quite well known to anyone who's watched a pirate film, really. Certainly the best example I can think of would be Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean series, the Johnny Depp-led films in which Davy Jones does feature. And apparently, and it's not something I've researched personally, but so I'm told, apparently this expression is Welsh because it derives from the fact that Welsh sailors would invoke the name of their patron saint, Saint David, in times of need, or at any time, I guess, but particularly at times of need. If the boat is going down, they are praying to Saint David. And this could be the origin of Davy Jones's, of course, Jones is as Welsh as you can get when it comes to a name, of Davy Jones's locker. And sticking with the Welsh sailors, we are now going to look at a few more bits of Trevelyan's rapid-fire bits of folklore. And she tells us that the following bits of lore have all been gleaned from Welsh captains and pilots. So straight from the people themselves. And we are told that when first stepping ashore or entering a ship or boat, advance with the left foot first for luck. So remember that one, when you step ashore, left foot first. Have a penny over the ship's bow when coming out of the docks if you would have prosperity and a successful voyage. So have that penny ready. Welsh sailors' wives formerly gave their husbands a piece of bread that had been baked on Good Friday to protect them against shipwreck. And now we've got some cat-based folklore, some catty folklore. And it was said that the mewing of a cat on board foretakens a serious voyage, as opposed to an unserious voyage, I guess, a laugh-a-minute voyage with, with clouds and things. But a cat can do more than predict a serious voyage. And it was said that if a cat stretches so that her paws meet before reaching Lundy Island from any port in the Bristol Channel, storms will be encountered. And there's even more feline folklore, and that is when cats are frolicsome, yes, frolicsome on board a ship, the Welsh sailors say a gale of wind is in their tails and there is rain in their faces which I think is a wonderful expression. A gale of wind is in their tails and there is rain in their faces. And what I was saying earlier about the barometer, well, you can forget that now. Just get a cat on board and it can do a much better job. Because if the ship's cat wipes its face often with its paw, trouble is ahead. When the animal turns its back to the captain, to the galley fire, or the cabin stove, the ship is likely to strike a rock or be stranded. And if it scratches the mast with its claws or singes any part of its body, nothing in the world 
can save the crew, for all hands are bound to go down. So never mind predicting a little bit of rain. Cats can really tell you about the big important things. And what could be more important than abandon all hope? The ship is definitely going down. Now, let's wrap up these quickfire bits of folklore and take a look at those wonderful little stories I was talking about, about the, the, the devil and the corpse candles and things. But very quickly, Trevelyan also tells us that never hand anything through the ship's ladder. And this idea of ladders and bad luck is something I am sure we are all familiar with. We, we've all heard of not walking under ladders before. And she also tells us of an old captain from Milford, Milford Haven, who I mentioned on episode 39, the episode about ghost ships. But just to recap that quickly, there was a captain from Milford who was hired just to take ships out on their maiden voyage, just just the once because he was considered good luck and that was it and if you'd like to know more about that one or about Milford and the ghost ships and why why wouldn't you then please check out episode 39 after listening to this one now let us look at what i described earlier as a kind of nautical corpse candle and i think this is it's perfect for this podcast it ties in with all these other death omens and things we've spoken about on previous podcasts but until now we have not looked at this kind of phenomena on the high seas and they are described by Trevelyan as electric illuminations or phosphorescent gleams that are sometimes seen playing around the masts and rigging of ships which were called by old Welsh sailors as canoill ar asprid which translates as spirit candles and does sound an awful lot like canoill corf which is the Welsh for corpse candles so there's a direct link here these are spirit candles and they are also known as canoill ar asprid glan candles of the Holy Ghost or the candles of Saint David or they could just be referred to in English as a form of of Saint Elmo's fire but specifically seen around the mast or the rigging of a ship and Trevelyan gives us a few other examples as well the Italians would call them Saint Elmo's stars by the French and Spaniards they were called Saint Elmo's fire straightforward and to the Russians, they are familiar as St. Nicholas's and St. Peter's Light. So it sounds like every country in the world has their own name for these. But as this is beaming to you from Wales, we are going to stick to Canoill Araspred, to spirit candles. And we are told that when two illuminations appeared, two spirit candles at the same time, they were regarded as tokens of fair weather and a prosperous voyage but many lights seen suddenly in a storm indicated an early calm or that the worst of the storm had passed so even though the name canoth arasperid spirit candles sounds quite eerie like the kind of things you would not like to see when they were encountered it usually meant the worst is behind you the good times are ahead but things do get a little eerier in our next little bit of law, or a little yarn, as she refers to it. And this particular yarn was used by Welsh sailors, older Welsh sailors in the early 19th century to scare each other with. And they claimed the devil himself created a three-masted ship from wood in the underworld. The devil had crafted this ship down in hell, this three-masted ship, and it smelt so strongly of sulphur that it was a pest to the coast of Wales. Why? Why he was sailing it around Wales, I don't know. Because we have the best coastline, I imagine, the best coastline in the world. But anyway, he was sailing his smelly, sulphur-smelling boat around the coast of Wales, and in this ship... The devil placed the souls of people who died in a very sinful condition. 
So if you'd been up to some naughty things, your soul could end up on this sulphur-smelling boat on the coast of Wales. Whenever a fresh cargo of souls was taken on board, the devil was extravagantly delighted. What the devil hadn't really taken into account, though, is that you can't just sail around Wales doing whatever the heck you want without bringing yourself to the attention of and annoying our resident saints. And St. David, according to some sailors, St. Donat, according to others, became greatly enraged about this. And so St. David or St. Donat pierced the hull of that ship with their spear. At that very moment, the devil was counting the souls on board. I can just picture him like Scrooge McDuck surrounded by this big room full of souls and he's counting away and all of a sudden his boat is attacked, it's sinking and he just barely manages to escape and swims away. And as a nice little epilogue, a truly fantastical epilogue to this tale, the ship was indeed wrecked afterwards and a giant, yes, a giant on the coast of Gower, just outside of Swansea on the Gower Peninsula, made a toothpick of the mast and a handkerchief of the mainsail. And there are those who believe that the ship can still be found to this day among the wrecks on the golden sands of the Gower coast. If you are lucky enough to live nearby, or even if you just do a lucky internet image search, maybe you can locate this boat. And if you look extra closely, maybe you can pinpoint the spot where that spear might have penetrated the hull. And finally, to wrap things up with a few more of Trevelyan's short and sweet snippets of folklore, she tells us that Welsh sailors object to going on board ships named after things that sting because they are generally doomed to destruction. By that, I'm assuming she means wasps and bees, etc. So there you go. Don't, don't go on a ship called Wasp. They say that if anything is lent to another boat, luck goes with it unless some portion of the article is first slightly damaged, broken, or willfully torn. So if another boat asks to borrow your map, you have to tear a corner or something off first, otherwise you're bringing bad luck on yourself. If an article is stolen from a ship, the thief has taken the luck too, and if possible, it must be brought back at any price. So maybe if you're vindictive and you wanted to give another ship bad luck, sneak on board, steal that map before they can rip the corner, sneak back off again and watch what happens. And there's more. Whistling at sea near the coasts of Wales was regarded as very unlucky for unfavourable winds and misfortune were likely to follow the ship. That's a very, very vague one, that one, isn't it? If anyone is whistling at sea near the coast, I mean, not even on the coast, near the coast, it's regarded as unlucky. Considering how many people live near the coast, you'd have to outlaw whistling in all of Wales, I think. And finally, the old Welsh sea captains would not allow spinning wheels on board for they brought disaster, but a child of either sex indicated successful voyages. So a boy on board is good, a girl on board is good. A spinning wheel, however, is not so good and you don't want a spinning wheel on your ship. All of which reminds me of one of my favourite operas, The Flying Dutchman, which, spookily, does involve a ghost ship and does have as one of its more well-known songs the spinning chorus whirl and whirl good wheel and maybe i've just solved the riddle of the flying dutchman maybe the reason he was so doomed is this spinning song which welsh folklore tells us is terrible terrible luck who knows what i do know is that I am going to dig out one of my DVD versions starring Bryn Turville as the Dutchman and 
recorded in Zurich. And watch that right now. So let's wrap up this episode. And it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian am Grando. If you have enjoyed it, I would love it if you hit the subscribe button and then you'll never miss an episode ever. If you have any comments to make or you'd like to say hello, I'm quite easy to track down online and on social media. And until next time, I've been Mark Reese. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. It's the best. It's the beautiful. It's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And if you're thinking of sailing the high seas anytime soon, I hope those little bits of folklore come in handy. Just avoid the ship with the three masts. No star. Thank you.